I'm in New York and it's April 2nd, which is my birthday. For pretty much my whole adult life, my mom used to call me at seven in the morning on my birthday, wake me up and remind me right about now you were being born. But that hasn't happened for seven or eight years. And obviously it isn't happening this year, but it's fun being in New York, shopping around. I feel like she's kind of everywhere just because we've been here so many times. And also she actually is here in a bag in my pocket because uh, I brought some of her with me to leave here somewhere, maybe. Also, we just came out of um, seeing Sweeney Todd with Josh Groban, which is funny to me that even after she passed away, I still managed to find a way to drag her to Sondheim shows. But it's Josh Groban, so she would have loved it. I'm Gavin Crawford. This is Let's Not Be Kidding. Episode 7. Good grief. Hi, Gavin. Hi. How's it going? Oh, it's so great. Weirdly, we're both out... Uh, the other side of exactly. the Alzheimer's strain in pretty close proximity to each other. Very close proximity. We haven't had a huge catch up. So, you know, we've like texted no, a little bit. There's but... been a little bit of texting. Yeah. A few so... ins- inspirational J.R.R. Tolkien quotes <laughs> yes. flying back and forth. <laughs> this is a bit of a conversation I had with my friend Aurora Brown of Baroness Von Sketch Show, who I had talked to earlier on this podcast and weirdly... Her dad actually passed away from Alzheimer's a couple of weeks after my mom did. That's that's foolish. I had to tape it because news the night that my mom died at like probably like 11 in the morning. Yeah. And then I had to come into work and tape uh, 90 minutes of news comedy. Oh, my God. And I was so show must go on. Yeah. Like I just turned into that. Yeah. Like. That your favorite uncle died at dawn. <laughs> Top of that, your mom pa parting. You're broken hearted, but you go on. And I was like, I literally, everyone was like, well, you can't come and do the show tonight. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, you do not understand how much I have to come and yeah. do the show tonight. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. what am I going to do? Sit here in a puddle of my own salty tears? Like, yeah. I'd love to pretend not to be me. Yes. That would I'm be like, great. <laughs> please, give me a reason to pretend. Yeah. I'm like, pretending to feel a way that I don't is my whole existence. <laughs> That's the entire thing I'm trained. This is the it's, only it's thing the I'm literally trained to do. Yes. <laughs> I feel a little checked out, which I was not expecting. I'm not, like, depressed, really, about it, but it's just... I I don't feel, like, super engaged in the world right now. You know the, the stupid things people say after people die, like, oh, the world's like a duller place without you. But then that's sort of really true. It's weird. It's a weird time. Not as weird as the immediate aftermath, I will say. The immediate aftermath was something I was not prepared for. Because this is what they don't tell you. It's what they can't tell you, is that you're going to feel happy. Alzheimer's is so terrible at the end that you're just like, at least they're not that anymore. Like, they're not trapped inside of themselves, not being themselves anymore. And there's this crazy overwhelming of fly free little bird At first you think, oh, am I just kidding myself to make myself feel better about this? And then you think I must be because you don't want to feel good about it, but you genuinely feel good about it. And I talked to every member of my family and everyone felt a little bit bad for feeling a little bit good. (laughs) 
I've had an interesting experience because it's been two months now, and I've only just realized that it was two months because I said to my brother the other day, Mom died like over a month ago. He goes, two months, Scott. This is Scott Thompson of Kids in the Hall of Fame, who also lost his mom to dementia. She passed away just a few months before we recorded this interview. I didn't fall apart, but I did put a lot of things on hold, like emails. I just decided I'm not going to answer any of these things for a while. And it just went on and on until I went, oh, my God, I've let everything back up. But I didn't collapse into grief or tears or immobility or anything like that. And that kind of, I went, shouldn't I be more devastated? But the truth is, I'd been mourning her for years. Like, she died years ago. And, of course, this is this is the real thing. But there is a relief. And that's the hard part. That's the most difficult thing is you have to cope with the fact that you're relieved. It's not just about you having it easier. You don't want them in that state. You don't want them to be miserable. Well, that's the thing. Like, I don't know. I can think so many things, but I don't know if she's scared all the time. Yeah, I don't know what what she knows. Like, I don't even care if she's sad. Yeah. I just don't want her to be scared. Yeah, my mom was scared. Scared. Scared and sad. Lonely. Um, and and, because every time I'd leave, she'd cry. And the last time I saw her about a week before she died, she didn't even open her eyes. She'd gone that far because, you know, dementia, my mother didn't have Alzheimer's. She had dementia, Mm -hmm. but she had gone to the point where she couldn't feed herself. She couldn't uh, drink. She couldn't, she barely opened her eyes. She could not speak at all. She basically became reduced to like a little girl who looks like an old lady doll, not even an actual old lady, an old lady doll, like an apple doll. And who just, you enter a room and all she would do is kiss. She just wanted to kiss. So all the nurses and care workers, she would see them and she would just grab their faces and kiss them. That's all she wanted to do was kiss people, which I thought was kind of beautiful. And go, when you see your mother reduced to her essence, her essence is love. And that was wonderful to re it's interesting now she's more alive than she was the last few years because now i can picture her in all the different times of her life and i can picture her in her prime when she was raising us when we were like at home and in her 50s in her 60s in her 40s you know what i mean her prime years when she was a phenomenal character a phenomenal woman this force of nature and she's more alive to me now when i think of my mother now i picture her when she sent me off to university or i picture her when her sister would visit you know i I picture her when she would say scott there's a sydney poitier movie on tv let's watch it that was that was our thing she loved sydney poitier so if there was a sydney poitier movie on we would uh watch it and well, you uh, love Sydney Poitier. Well, too. I love Sydney Poitier. Maybe that's my love of black men with British accents. <laughs> <laughs> Don't but, say you didn't get nothing for him. <laughs> it's weird when you lose a parent to Alzheimer's because some of your feelings seem inappropriate. Like, you feel bad, but then you also, in a weird way, feel good. And then you worry, like, am I grieving enough? Like, I found myself thinking, like, is this it? Like, am I okay? I guess I'm okay. And you think for a while, like, you kind of got off scot-free. That's what I sort of thought, like, up until, like, maybe last week, you know, where I'm I'm sort of like, well, you know what? I've done this podcast. I've, I've, I've really talked about my mom. I've... I've sort of processed this, like, slow grieving. Because you do, you are grieving. And then I was like, maybe I've, maybe I've kind of done it. Like, maybe that's all that's left is the relief. You know, you've, you've done each marker. Like, you're like, I can't talk to her on the phone anymore. I can't talk to her in person anymore. She doesn't have words anymore. She can't go for a drive with me anymore. You just, you lose things inch by inch. It's like pulling strands out of a sweater until there's no sweater left. And then you think like, okay, well, I've I've been missing that sweater for such a long time. I'm probably not really going to miss it. But now I'm starting to feel the 
the grief beyond relief. I, I laughed a lot, which, which I needed, and you know, you you need that. It's amazing how much you need to laugh. Yeah, <laughs> at things. yeah. So, scrolling forward. Did you have a funeral? Did you do all yep. have all those preparations in hand and everything? We put together a, a service. We decided that we would we all wanted to speak. We kind of divided it up by subject because he was a multifaceted guy. We got music involved because he loved live music and supported live music. My nephew sang a song. We talked about him as a dad, his struggles with mental health, his history, and I talked about him in sailing because he and I had done so much sailing. And at the end, we blew a blast on the horn from his boat because a, a six-second blast is what you, how you signal a boat is leaving or arriving. Oh. Yeah. And so so the whole, like, the Frodo thing, you know, like sailing over a yeah. swift sunrise. It's like I'm getting teared up yeah. this because it's like boats, <clears throat> something about boats sailing to the white shores. That was the only thing that was keeping me going. It's yeah. just that, that, no, this is like oh, that yeah. little speech, this is not the end. This is when the gray rain curtain pulls back and then you see it. Yeah. In case you're not a giant nerd, those words of comfort come from Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. I think they're also in the book somewhere, but not in the exact same way. But in the movie, Pippin and Gandalf are about to face the final war. And Pippin says, I didn't think it would end this way. And Gandalf says, end, no. It doesn't end here. The gray rain curtain of this world pulls back and all turns to silver glass. And then you see it. White shores. And beyond, a far green country. I have some questions for you, too. Um, I wondered what happened to you physically afterwards. Because, I'll tell you why, because on one hand, I fell apart, like my fingers are cracking, it was stressful, I was working, you know, like all these kind of stressful things. But on the other hand, I started feeling immediately better because the amount of my mana, you know, my life meter was being siphoned off constantly just by the worry, just knowing something might happen. And once that was done I felt like oh my god like I'm I'm filling up again with like some endorphins how have you been how's your body uh weirdly I immediately got more handsome <laughs> uh <laughs> like quite startlingly a lot more handsome uh no I mean uh initially I had like grief relief uh -huh. and then it took about a month and then I had a weird kind of numbness yeah uh which I think I maybe I'm sort of pulling out out of ish now, right? Um, but I mean, I was cracking jokes even at the literally at the interment. Like oh, we yeah. had this like lovely celebration of life. We planned it all. It was lovely. We had our paintings. Yeah. Very people came. It was very nice. And then we got to the thing the next day, and we had this little urn full of ashes because we're putting the cremains on top of her parents' graves. And then all of our names are written on the back of the grave, Ew, that uh, is which weird. is weird, <laughs> and with just like our birthday and then a dash. Oh my god! So it's just there waiting, like a weird <laughs> ma. Um, and we had to like we had a very weird moment, like we're sitting in the cemetery with like the person and being like, okay, well, what what section do you want to open up? Like, mm -hmm. are you putting on top of her dad or her mom? Oh. And then we have to have this weird conversation. We're like, who did she like more? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like with me and my sisters, and we're like, I think she'd probably want to be in her dad. But I've we're like, daughters kind of want to be in that. Or is right. that misogynist? We didn't like, and we're having this all these weird, and they like she's literally drawing tic tac toe like on a map of my grandparents' grave, being like, you got A, B, C, D. There's seven slots. It's one for each of you. It's a Sudoku. And then yeah. and then you know we're sitting there with my distraught dad. You know, and he's like, I don't know, I guess if you put her in number two and I guess I'll take number one. And like, it's, you're trying not to laugh, but it's so absurd. 
I found very odd that they bury the urn, like that they make a tiny little hole and then put, why? Like, why do you even need, I guess you need a place? That's Kyle Tingley, whose shoulders must be pretty sore from having me lean on them, especially during that particularly weird week. It seems so silly to do that. You could just keep her on the mantle or something. You don't need to put her in the ground. But anyway, there's a little hole. There was a bit of a conundrum because half the people wanted the ashes to just stay unmolested Mm -hmm. in the little nice urn. And some of us, meaning me, was like, I am 100% taking some of these to New York Mm -hmm. or various places around the world because I'm like, my mom is in New York. My mom is in all the places that we traveled. And I'm like, it's symbolic, I know. But I said that to myself. I'm like, you know what? It's already mixed up with pine or whatever box they yeah, did. Like, yeah. this is not, it's not a pure thing. And also, mom doesn't want to stay in the ground in Lethbridge, Alberta. She didn't like it. She doesn't like yeah. the wind. So I'm like, we got to travel this. But then every day, all day, the next day, all of my siblings and a couple of like sort of very close family friends, Kyle and I were staying in the trailer in the driveway and they kept knocking on the trailer door and being like, can I get a little scoop? (laughs) For real? So then Gavin, I just see, what's Gavin doing? He's going, he's sneaking into the camper, truck camper with someone and and then I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I had to give some of Donna to, oh, I shouldn't even say the name because everyone would be really mad if they know I think that. So he just snuck in to like divide Donna up a little bit. I don't know. It's so weird. But yeah, he's just sneaking off to scoop her into a baggie. She's in a baggie in her bedroom. It was supposed to just be my sisters and brother and my dad at the gravesite. And we were going to just inter the little vase into the thing. And I don't know why I thought someone would have thought of something to say or do that wasn't me, but I kind of felt like I, like, you know, I did my due diligence at the memorial event the night before. And so I was kind of just, like, not prepared to do anything other than just, like, watch the thing get put in the ground. But then, of course, because it's my mom and everyone liked my mom, like, we get to the gravesite and there's 50 people there. There's like friends, there's my dad's brothers and sisters, all my aunts and uncles, cousins. It's a huge event and we've planned nothing. There's nothing happening. We're all at the graveyard and no one's in charge, kind of. And then Keith didn't really get up and say anything. He just kind of nudged Gavin and said, okay, get up there and say things. And Gav's like, what? And he's really upset because it's like the final end. You know, we're just standing there and then my dad's like, just say something. And I'm like, I can't because like now I can't talk because now it's like it feels final. It feels like a final goodbye. So I have to go up and be like, thanks everyone for coming. This is what we're doing. And then my dad sidles up to me again and is like, okay, now grab your sisters and put that thing in the ground. <laughs> and I'm like, you're killing me, old man. Like, Why do too you have loud. to announce to everybody what the arrangement is? I know. The, and then like... I'm like, so then I look at my sisters and they all immediately look at the ground. Mm-hmm. I think my one sister, Reagan, came up like to help me. And then we're like, where's the bag? Because there was like a velvet bag with straps that you had to like a lower. A velvet bag? Yeah, it's like a velvet velvet? bag that goes around the urn. And then my brother's like, it's in the car. And then so we're all standing there just awkwardly while he runs back to the truck to get the velvet bag. And then I like, I'm I'm like lowering the thing into the ground, like not knowing at all what to say because we hadn't really prepped anything. That moment, yeah. And then everyone, like the little kids, like there were some roses and from the flower arrangements the night before. So all the little kids are like throwing roses into the hole. And then we're just standing there and I'm like, okay, I guess now uh, in honor of mom, we're all going to go over to the bay f- and just browse for two hours and not buy a fucking thing. <laughs> oh, I gotta love It's that. like really cut the tension. And then they're like, okay, let's all have a photo around the grave. It's like, what? 
And now one with the kid. Like, it was like a wedding photos around the gravestone. I'm like, what is happening? Is this how... Does this happen? Is this what people do? What are you going to look at this photo for? Like, I don't, <laughs> like, don't want to see this photo ever again. Like, we're like, this is not a fucking grad ceremony. But anyways, I'm trying to keep my cool, but I'm on the verge of just like... Uh, you know, everything bubbling up. And then I just like go and stand behind a tree. And then I realize like I cannot be there for one more second. And I just grab Kyle and I'm like, get in the car, drive, drive. But it was nice. I mean, the weirdest thing was, you always say, like, uh, we always were like, oh, yeah, m- our mom is, like, mother to the world. Like, we kept having to say in the eulogy, like, you know, she was a mom to us, but, like, also to a number of people. But uh, the number of people who kind of came up and would just be like, I don't know if you know this, but, like, you know, your mom's the one that got me out of my first abusive relationship. She drove to Edmonton and... and uh, you know, hustled me out of the house in the middle of the night. Or, you know, someone would be like, oh, I don't know if you know this, but your mom was the one that took me to rehab. Or, I don't know if you know this, but, like, your mom bailed me out of jail, like, three times. And, like, that happened, like, such a number of times. Like, I'm not saying she was a saint, but she was definitely, like, the person people would go to when they couldn't tell anybody else what was going on. And she was pretty good at keeping it a secret because I didn't know. I started to be expecting someone to come up and be like, I don't know if you know this, but like your mom and I buried a body. Your mom's the one that helped me murder my abusive husband. We put him in the trunk and drove him to the lake. I mean, last time you, we were talking, you kind of very eloquently described your dad and what was happening with him as a pointless painting. Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of painting is he to you now? Oh, that is a really good... Um, I guess he's back to being a complete painting. He's he's not even a painting anymore. He's everywhere. He's um, he's sailing somewhere, is, is what I think of it. So he's together and he's 3D and he's um, out doing what he loves. My dad has, or I've tucked him into so many other places in the world. Because of sailing, I've tucked him into the weather and the sky. So pretty much any time, it sounds so cheesy, any time the wind blows, <laughs> uh, I do think of my dad because I think of sailing and um, I can just think about him like standing on the boat, steering the boat. It's nice. Yeah. It's the same thing for me with my mom because she's not in a place like I can just think of her everywhere. Like even yesterday yeah. I was just I was filling the car up with gas and I just like I don't know all of a sudden just started thinking about my mom and then I was just like oh I can just say hi. So then I just was like standing at the gas pump and I was like I just kind of looked up at the sky a little bit and was like hey mom. Yeah. And then weirdly just as I did that um I looked up and there was like this tree and then a gust of wind blew and the tree branch kind of like went up and down. And my mom always used to like tell people like, oh, if you, you know, if you're missing someone, just look at a tree because that's them waving at you. Oh. And that tree was just like waving and I knew, it was, you know, a blizzard was coming. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a part of me that was like, so I just like, you know, I waved at the tree and it made me have a little smile. Yeah. And then I got back in the car and Kyle was like, what are you smiling at? And I was like, literally nothing you don't want to know. Yeah. I guess your mom's like Ben Kenobi. She's yeah. become more powerful than you could possibly imagine. Yeah. At the beginning of this, I was sort of asking the question, like, why am I even doing this? Like, yeah. partly I was like, well, I, I want to talk. I need to talk about it just as a mm-hmm. steam valve release. Yeah. But then I'm also like, who want, who is this for? Who cares? Like, oh, sure. Come and be sad about someone you don't even know. Uh, but then I was like... So I started to think of it as like a, an FAQ or like a walkthrough, you know, right? video game yeah, walkthroughs yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. where you're like, you're playing a game and then you're just like, I wonder if anyone else had trouble with this part. Yes. And, and you go online, there's a thousand videos. And there's like, like hey, a thousand hey people guys, being like, here's my run through of level A. Um, yeah. 
I it's think, like, oh my god, this wall is so frustrating. Like, is anyone else having trouble getting yes, up this wall? Everybody's and having like, trouble. So everybody's like, having trouble. I just t- try to look at life now as uh, the same way that the the feelings in Inside Out would look at the wall of little moments of Riley's day, and like if you had more joy than the other ones, that was a good day. And I've been reading the Silmarillion and thinking about the Silmarillion a lot, and about. Tolkien and what he says about like the gift of death that elves don't have. Elves are, you know, they're immortal unless you kill them. But even then they get to persist in in spirit form. But they don't know what in Tolkien what happens to humans because they just die. They don't go to the halls of Mandos. But there's a, a the bittersweet quality of that is actually a gift that life is can be sweeter when it's in smaller bits. And we have this very small bit. And so I've just kind of committed to like making it sweet um, every moment and telling my sisters that I love them and, you know, doing work that I enjoy because we could get hit by a bus tomorrow or we could catch COVID tomorrow. (laughs) Or we could slowly, very, very Very slowly slowly. over the process of a number of years Years. begin to forget everything (laughs) we've ever known. Exactly. Uh, So I better enjoy it now. I'll take the bus. (laughs) I'd take the bus as well. I was going to say, like, if if it's an option, I'd take the bus. Well? Well, I don't know if I need to say anything. Well, I I don't know if you need to say anything. I'm just like, are you going to do it? Yeah. Yeah, hold it. Okay. Um, I can't open it. Don't open it. I didn't put it at the root of this tree. Just a little bit. Okay. There you go. Now you're part of a tree. Well. Oh my God, your pants are filthy. I washed them. Well, we've dropped mom off somewhere in New York in an undisclosed location for legal reasons. But it's somewhere where I know where it is. And it's near shops. Everywhere's near shops. That's why she would like it. <laughs> if I asked her if she wanted to stay in Southern Albert or rather we take some of her to New York, I know exactly well, what New she'd York, say. Of course. <laughs> Southern Albert has its charms, but you know, let's not be kidding. See you around. Plausibly, I think I finally have run out of things to say. So I guess just let me say this. I want to give a huge heartfelt thanks to everybody who spoke to me for this podcast. Jan Arden, Scott Thompson, Aurora Brown, Frank Webb, Rachel Matlow, Nora McClellan, J.P. LaRock, Carrie Sackney, David Carroll, my amazing producer, Dr. Sharon Cohen, of course, my dad, Keith Crawford, 
my sister Regan and all my other siblings for contributing in ways that aren't necessarily on tape. And of course, my rock of the last 30 years, Kyle Tingley. And I want to thank every one of you who listened to these seven episodes. I hope that they were fun or at least helpful. And if not, I don't know, I guess just forget they ever happened. You've been listening to Let's Not Be Kidding from CBC Podcasts. The show is written and hosted by me, Gavin Crawford. David Carroll is my story editor, producer, and sound designer. Emily Cannell is our digital coordinating producer. Original music by William Lamoureux. Our senior producer is Damon Fairless. Our podcast art was designed by Tara Paquette. Cross-promo producer, Amanda Cox. Our video producer is Evan Igard. Audio mastering was done by the master, Pete Mori. Special thanks to Elizabeth Bowie, Betty Burke, and Shauna Watson. Executive producers, Cecil Fernandez and Chris Oak. Tanya Springer is our senior manager. Arif Nurani is the director, and Leslie Merklinger is the executive director of CBC Podcasts. <laughs>